Thank you, Matthew. You did a great job with those names, too, by the way. You may have noticed that in my uh, back little office area, I have a passage that I've written down and I've posted right next to where I sit down. Uh, and it's from Jeremiah, it's Jeremiah 48.10. Uh, and it says, Cursed is he who does the work of the Lord with slackness, and cursed is he who keeps back his sword from bloodshed. Uh, and I had originally put it there uh, a long time ago because I had wanted uh, something to motivate me to uh, not do the work of the Lord in any kind of lazy way, not to do it with slackness. And so I picked that verse, uh, Cursed is he who does the work of the Lord with slackness. And I had almost not included the second part of the verse, but I felt weird keeping it out. Uh, the second part says, Cursed is he who keeps back his sword from bloodshed. And as I read it and reread it and thought about it, it, I realized that those two things really need to go together. That those are two different ways of not conducting the work of the Lord. One is with laziness. Cursed is he who does the work of the Lord with slackness. Uh, but the other is through inaction. Cursed is he who keeps back his sword from bloodshed which is something God regularly warned the prophets about, that uh, they had a responsibility to teach the people what God had said, and if they didn't do it, they would bear the price. And really the idea is, you know, cursed is the one who doesn't strike. This doesn't mean that we just go around picking up swords and, and, and slaying people, but it means that there's, there's a principle there, that there is a time to strike, and there is a time to refrain from striking. Very much an Ecclesiastes kind of a thing. And this morning I want us to understand this. The reason I say this is because we need to know how to handle opposition when we're faced with it. And depending on different scenarios, we handle it in different ways. Uh, and there is a time to, uh, to wait. There's a time to be merciful but there is also a time to take action and to do something about it. And this morning, we're going to look at Nehemiah. Uh, and I asked Matthew to read chapter 6, though honestly we're going to look at a number of different passages within Nehemiah. Because in Nehemiah, you see a man, Nehemiah, who is constantly faced with opposition to this work he has, this task. And the first half or so of the book is really concerned with his rebuilding the wall in Jerusalem. Uh, and uh, I, I'm not going to spend too much time on Nehemiah. I, I'm trusting in many ways that you're at least somewhat familiar with the story. Uh, but, but just to kind of refresh ourselves, this is after the exile, when the Israelites are returning to Judah. And there are a few books that take place during this time, like Ezra and Nehemiah. In fact, in the Jewish canon, Ezra and Nehemiah was one book. Uh, and then there are prophets like Zechariah and Haggai. Uh, and there's a, a space within those books of something about like 100 years or so. And there are people returning to Jerusalem to rebuild, to work. And they're focused on rebuilding the temple, uh, reteaching people the law, reestablishing worship. But Nehemiah in particular is concerned with rebuilding the wall. He wants to rebuild the wall in Jerusalem. This is something that weighs heavily on his heart, and he feels obligated and commissioned by God to carry out this task. Uh, and one of the reasons why I really like Nehemiah is because I think his interactions with God and how he goes about doing his work is very similar to our interactions today. It's not like Daniel, where Daniel is having visions of God and angels are coming to him. I think most people don't have that experience. Uh, it's not like David, where David is writing psalms, he's writing scripture, uh, he, he's having, you know, he's talking to prophets, he has a covenant with God. Uh, there, that's a very unique situation. For most of us, I think it's going to be Nehemiah's experience, which is there's something on our mind, something that weighs heavily on us, and then we bring it to God in prayer, 
And then doors are opened through it. And even though God is not speaking directly to us in, in audible words, we know that God is at work in our lives. And so we follow through with it and we trust that. And that's really Nehemiah's experience. And I want us to look at Nehemiah and how he faced opposition. Because really, I think there are universal uh, experiences within this book. That it's not limited to um, his time period, his situation, that really the opposition he faces, how the opposition interacts with Nehemiah, and his response to the opposition are universal enough that they even apply to us today. That there are patterns we can see even today, and there are responses that we can conduct today. And so I want us to take some time, uh, look at Nehemiah, and see what it is to face opposition. Uh, And first, we're going to start here uh, with various forms of opposition. There are two in particular we're going to be concerned with. Nehemiah, the first form of opposition that comes about are these people who are enemies of his work. Particularly, it's going to be two men, uh, Sanballat and Tobiah, although there are others named. uh, Matthew had a long list of names you had to read. Uh, So there are other people who are named, people who are against this work, but particularly these two men are enemies of Nehemiah's work. And I want us to look at what they do, how they do it, because it's not at all different today with the opposition that much of the church faces, that we may have faced in the past, we may face in the future. Uh, We need to be able to recognize opposition when it happens so that we can realize it for what it is. Uh, The first way that this opposition comes about is that they begin to create plans. They create plans and they make accusations. Those are two different things, but you'll notice they're they're very much uh, conspirators. They're schemers. So in in chapter 6, in verse 2, it says, Sanballat and Geshem sent to me, saying, Come and let us meet together at Hakephirim in the plain of Ono. But they intended to do me harm. Right? They're planning. They're manipulating. They're scheming. And this is a form of opposition that the church even faces at times, isn't it? People who make plans. They, they play games. They scheme in many ways. And we need to be able to recognize this for what it is. So they, they're people who, who create plans to draw him out, uh, to do him harm. And then, they, and then when that doesn't work, they later on start making accusations. Verse 5, In the same way Sambalat for the fifth time sent his servant to me with an open letter in his hand. And it was written, It is reported among the nations, and Geshem also says it, that you and the Jews intend to rebel. That is why you are building the wall. And according to these reports, you wish to become their king. So they start making accusations. One of the quickest ways to get a response from someone is to make a false accusation, isn't it? No one likes to be falsely accused of anything. They start, you're going to notice this pattern. Please pay attention to it. They're scheming. They're manipulating. There's a plan here. And this is totally opposing the work that Nehemiah has and that he's been commissioned by God. So that doesn't really work. And then they continue on and they start to bribe prophets. Uh, In chapter 6, verses 10 through 14, you read this account where he's in the house of Shemaiah in verse 10 there. And this man says to him, let us meet together in the house of God within the temple. Let us close the doors of the temple for they're coming to kill you. They're coming to kill you by night. So they start bribing this man. And by the way, this is not a false prophet. A false prophet is someone who pretends to be a prophet, but is not really a prophet. This is a real prophet who has been bribed in order to lie. There's, there's really a difference. It's sort of like Judas. You know, Judas was not a false apostle. He was not pretending to be apostle. He was an apostle. But he was also someone who could be bribed and manipulated. But he's not the only one because you read in verse 14, 
where uh, Nehemiah declares, Remember Tobiah and Sambalat, O my God, according to the things that they did, and also the prophetess Noadiah and the rest of the prophets who wanted to make me afraid. These men, Sambalat and Tobiah in particular, though there are some others who are at work here, are totally opposing the work and they're doing so through plans, through accusations, through schemes. Really, they're, 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 they're playing what we call mind games. But they're mind games that don't have any good reason. There's no moral objection. This is, if there's anything that you remember from this lesson, please remember this. They don't have a good reason. There is no moral objection. There's no kind of old, old, uh, uh, super righteousness, right? And there's, there's nothing that allows them to do this. They're just doing it because uh, they're totally opposed to the work. That's it. You look earlier in chapter 2. We're going to look at this in a minute, but in chapter 2, verse 10, it says, When Sanballat and the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite servant heard this, it displeased them greatly. Why? That someone had come to seek the welfare of the people of Israel. That's why they're mad. That's why they're opposed to this. You look back in chapter 6, and they're making plans, they're making accusations for no good reason other than they just don't want the work to continue. And they don't want to see Israel succeed. We're not dealing with what we would call reasonable people. We're not dealing with people who are interested in ultimate truth. These are just schemers, plan makers, people who play mind games to stop work that is a good work and that is commissioned by God. And we have to be able to recognize it for what it is because it's really difficult to face opposition. We often second guess ourselves when we're facing opposition. We have to be able to spot this because this kind of stuff comes up. So they start bribing prophets uh, and Tobiah himself, very interesting character. He's actually well connected to the people of Judah. So uh, if you caught this in, at the end there of chapter 16, or ch uh, chapter 6, in verse 17, it says, Moreover, in those days, the nobles of Judah sent many letters to Tobiah, and Tobiah's letters came to them. For many in Judah were bound by oath to him, because he was the son in law of Shechaniah, the son of Era, and his son, Jehohanan, had taken the daughter of Meshulam, the son of Berechiah, as his wife. Also they spoke of his good deeds in my presence and reported my words to him, and Tobiah sent letters to make me afraid. So you have these people who are really bound by oath to him. They're bound by oath to him. They're not interested... Uh, Excuse me, they're bound by oath to Tobiah. So Tobiah has pawns, we would say. And they're, they're speaking well of him. Verse 19, they spoke of his good deeds in my presence and reported my words to him. So they're working as spies. And in the process, they're saying he's not such a bad guy. He's actually pretty good. Look at all these good things he's done. And by the way, if you were here Wednesday evening, I, I wrote this before Wednesday evening. They're saying, look at how good this guy is. They're trying to convince Nehemiah that Nehemiah is wrong. That he's at fault. In fact, to they're attacking Tobiah, if anything. You see, not much has changed over human history. This kind of stuff is so universal that we can look at a document that is before Christ and see, and see things that we would recognize in it. You see people planning, scheming, manipulating, trying to get 
I, nothing accomplished because they just want nothing to be done. And the point of all this uh, is just to stop the work. So in chapter 6, in verse 9, this is exactly what he says. For they all wanted to frighten us, thinking their hands will drop from the work and it will not be done. That's the reason. They don't want to seek the welfare of Israel. They don't want the work to continue. They just, they, we're not dealing with reasonable people. And so I ask, can't this happen uh, in the church even today? Aren't there people who maybe play mind games, who manipulate, who scheme? I've seen it before, long ago in the past. People come into the church and, and they're there to do nothing but cause trouble. And the mistake I've made is thinking that these are reasonable people who are interested in truth who are just mistaken. And that's, that's not the case. There's something else going on here. So Nehemiah's work is opposed by these men. And the way that they oppose it is through mind games, uh, through manipulation, uh, through reaching out to their resources, using people as a means to an end and sending out spies. And all Nehemiah wants to do is to do the work of God. And they don't want that to happen. That's, that's really what's going on here. That's the first form of opposition that we see in Nehemiah. The second form of opposition is going to be distractions. In chapter 5, we won't look at all of it, but verses 1 through 7 in particular are dealing with the fact that there are people who are poor who are being oppressed and people who are wealthy who are taking advantage. There's a famine in the land and many of the poor people... Uh, don't have the means for food. Uh, and so they become distracted because of this famine. They, they're interested in feeding their families, which is a very real concern, isn't it? But they're so distracted by this need for food and, and taking care of things to the point that they're not doing the work of God. Which Jesus, you know, the Sermon on the Mount, of course, says that we're to seek the kingdom of God first and his righteousness and all these things, money, clothing, uh, food, anything we need will be added to us along the way. So they're distracted. Distraction, uh, by the way, I think is probably going to be one of the major forms of opposition to the work of the church in our society uh, today. Probably the one we face more than anything, just a distraction. Anything that keeps us from doing the work of God is opposed to the work of God. So the poor are distracted uh, by want, uh, and the rich then are distracted by making a profit. They're interested in charging uh, usury interest, which is totally forbidden under the law of Moses. And they're interested in making a profit and getting things. Imagine for one second... You're a citizen of Jerusalem. Your city is, is still in ruins in some sense. And you have this group of people who are interested in just making money. And they're ruining everyone else around them while the rubble is still trying to be rebuilt. I mean, we would look at that and say, what, you should be united against something. There's something greater going on here. What are you being distracted from? And yet the same thing happens to many of us today. Many of our own towns are, are in moral ruins, moral decay. Many, many towns and cities in our country have totally abandoned God. And yet in the process, people are still distracted by making a profit, by getting things. Sometimes you... I don't know if you do this, but I like to do a little exercise where I try to imagine how God sees the world and what it would be like to just step back and be able to view it all. Because when you start playing this, this kind of game, you realize how absurd so much of our decisions really are. <laughs> 
two main forms of opposition to Nehemiah's work is one going to be people, enemies of the work, people who are interested in nothing more than stopping the work. But the other is going to be distractions, things that pull us away. And as I said, I think this is going to be one of the greatest forms of opposition that is faced in our country in the church today. People are distracted by careers, by families, uh, by, by just wanting things, what we call covetousness. Distraction takes up so much of our lives and pulls so many segments of our lives away from God. And anything that pulls us away from the work of God is opposed to the work of God. Now, don't get me wrong. There's nothing wrong with a family. There's nothing wrong with having a career. Those, those, those can be good things, but not if they distract us from ultimate goals uh, and really from a relationship with God. One of the great dangers about about distractions is that we often don't know we're distracted while we're being distracted. It really gets us there. You know, if I'm being persecuted by an enemy, at least I know I'm being beheaded while I'm being beheaded. Like there's no, there's no fooling me. There's no pulling the wool over my eyes. But I often don't realize I'm being distracted while I'm being distracted. And in that sense, I think distraction is maybe even a greater enemy than, than persecution. We'd almost prefer persecution. At least then we can know it's happening. At least we can recognize it for what it is. But distractions are so sneaky and so subtle. They really get us and pull us away from God. And before we know it, we're very far away. So those are going to be the two forms of opposition uh, in Nehemiah. But now I'd like to take a moment and look at what I'm calling the attitude of the people, really, the enemies who were opposed to Nehemiah. And this is what I spoke about before, that we're given information, we're going to look at this, that these are people who are not reasonable. They are not interested in ultimate truth. They have ulterior motives. It's exactly what Paul writes about in Romans 1. I feel like we have referenced Romans 1 so many times this year. Uh, but it's, it's just like that, where you have people who are not interested in God and they're using that as an excuse to sin. So we want us to look at the attitude of those opposing Nehemiah. First, they don't want Israel to succeed, as I read in Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 10. It's nothing more than that. They're just, they're displeased that someone had come to seek the welfare of the people of Israel. That's all. And there are many people today who are displeased when the church prospers. They don't want to see it growing. They don't want to see it thriving. They want the underdogs to remain the underdogs and to stay in their place. In fact, you, if when you read through Nehemiah, you begin to notice that Israel's success begins to anger them. So in chapter 4, verse 1, now, when Sanballat heard that we were building the wall, he was angry and greatly enraged, and he jeered at the Jews. Later in verse 7, But when Sanballat and Tobiah and the Arabs and the Ammonites and the Ashdodites heard that the repairing of the walls of Jerusalem was going forward and that the breaches were beginning to be closed, they were very angry. What kind of people become angry at another person's success? I mean, not, not reasonable people, not people who are interested in the welfare of others, not people who are interested in the work of God, especially when it's God's people who are being successful. There's something else going on here. And maybe we can't quite put our finger on it, but we know enough to know it's not good. <clears throat> There's something else. We actually know that the opposition was interested in things like wealth and status. So if you turn over to chapter 13, starting in verse 4. 
Now before this, Eliashib the priest, who was appointed over the chambers of the house of God, and who was related to Tobiah, there's our friend Tobiah again, prepared for Tobiah a large chamber where they had previously put the grain offering, the frankincense, the vessels, and the tithes of grain, wine, and oil, which were given by commandment to the Levites, singers, and gatekeepers, and the contributions for the priests. While this was taking place, I was not in Jerusalem, for in the 32nd year of Artaxerxes, king of Babylon, I went to the king. And after some time, I asked leave of the king and came to Jerusalem, and I then discovered the evil that Eliashib had done for Tobiah, preparing for him a chamber in the courts of the house of God. Let's go ahead and stop there. Do you think it's any accident that Tobiah, who already has a place to live, decides to set up a chamber in the house of God? Especially, uh, you'll notice there uh, in verse 5, he, he's taking the place where all these things are supposed to be given to the priests. All these contributions are supposed to be given to the priests. You think it's any coincidence that he set up his chamber in this location? Of course it's not. He's interested in status. He's interested in having a home in the house of God. This is why when you get to the New Testament, Jesus and Paul warn that there will be wolves in sheep's clothing. Right? Hold, hold your fingers in Nehemiah. Let's look at a couple of these passages. Then in Matthew chapter 7, in Matthew chapter 7, starting in verse 15, Jesus at the end of his Sermon on the Mount says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. That's exactly what we're doing back in Nehemiah. We're looking at the fruits of these men. Why are they doing what they're doing? Their, their words are saying one thing, but their actions are saying another. And Jesus here, when he talks about beware of false prophets, later on they would understand this to be these false teachers who would come in, people who pretend to be teachers, but are really interested in money and power and status and just causing problems. Later in Acts chapter 20, Paul before the, uh, the elders in Ephesus. In Acts chapter 20 warns them, starting in verse 28, Be careful, pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. I know that after my departure... Fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. If you turn back to Nehemiah, this is why in Nehemiah, we're, we're, we're paying close attention to this because things don't change. When we have to face opposition to our work as a church, we need to be able to recognize them by their fruits. And that's exactly what we're doing here throughout Nehemiah is we're seeing what is the, what is the fruit? What comes about when there is someone opposed to the work? How do they go about doing it? They often play mind games. They often throw around accusations. They're often interested in things like status and having position, and they are not reasonable people. They are people who are not interested in truth. This is why later on, Jesus and Paul will both write to have nothing more to do with these people. Jesus will write in Matthew 18 to treat them as Gentiles and tax collectors. Uh, in Titus 3, Paul will write to have nothing more to do with a divisive person after warning him once and then twice. Twice. 
Because you're not dealing with reasonable people. You're not dealing with someone where you can point out passages and say, look what this says. They're not interested in that. There's something else going on. That's really important for understanding why the opposition comes about. Uh, the really looking at the attitude of them, they're, they're different than we would think. So how does Nehemiah handle opposition? This, as I've said, I think is so universal that how Nehemiah handles it is something we can just take directly into our own lives. The first Nehemiah prayed. You read this constantly throughout the book of Nehemiah. The Nehemiah is a man of prayer. This first all comes about his rebuilding the wall because he's praying in chapter 1. And then in chapter 4, verse 9, you have these uh, verses where he says, uh, We prayed to our God and set a guard as a protection against them day and night. Uh, in chapter 5, verse 19, you have this little prayer inserted into the book itself as you, as you read again and again. He says, Remember for my good, O oh my God, all that I have done for this people. When faced with opposition... Our first response should be prayer, I think. Pray about it. Next, uh, this is really important too. Forget what I said. There are two things I really want you to remember from this lesson. He trusted the answer he received from his prayers. In chapter 1, he prays that there would be this 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 door opened that he could go back to help rebuild the wall in Jerusalem. He's so concerned about rebuilding the wall, he prays and he fasts for days. And God says yes. God opens doors for this. And Nehemiah carries that throughout the whole book. He doesn't forget that. Because as I said before, when we're faced with people opposed to our work, opposed to our lives, it often causes us to second-guess ourselves. Am, am I wrong? Am I in the right? Or is there something to what they're saying? Nehemiah got his answer and held on to that throughout the whole book. Which is, I think, a very important lesson for us. That just because God says yes to a prayer doesn't mean that there will not be opposition. It means that when we're faced with opposition, we hold on to that answer and we keep going. So not only does Nehemiah pray, but he trusts the answer, the, the answer he received from his prayers. Uh, and of course, all of this is rooted in the fact that he trusted God. I find chapter 1 uh, very interesting where in his prayer, you'll notice in verse 8, he says, remember the word that you've commanded your servant Moses, saying, if you are faithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though your outcasts are in the uttermost parts of heaven, from there I will gather them and bring them to the place that I've chosen to make my name dwell there. Nehemiah quotes God back to God. He, qu he quotes scripture to God and says, look, you said this and I know your word is good. So let's do something about this. And he's right. God opens a door for him through this. He trusted God's spoken words in his scripture. And I think very importantly, he trusted God's judgment. You'll notice he, Nehemiah, when he's opposed, regularly puts all judgment into God's hands. So in chapter 5, uh, verse 13 there's a, a place where he's dealing with the people. And even though he's dealing with the people, or this is what I talked about earlier, where there's the oppression of the poor and the rich are taking advantage of them, he still calls on God to be the judge. He says, I also shook out the fold of my garment and said, so may God shake out every man from his house and from his labor who does not keep this promise. So may he be shaken out and emptied. And later on in chapter 6, in verse 14, he, he calls out to God, Remember Tobiah and Sambalat, O oh my God, according to these things that they did, and also the prophetess Noah died and the rest of the prophets who wanted to make me afraid. He puts all judgment into God's hands. Judgment of his enemies, uh, as well as judgment even of himself. 
Because that's one of the, the, the double-edged swords about inviting the judgment of God is that we're judged as well. But Nehemiah trusted God to judge rightly. So uh, in chapter 5, 19, remember for my good, O oh my God, all that I have done for this people. He calls upon God to judge him. And he does this throughout Nehemiah. David did the same thing in Psalms, calling upon God, look into my heart, judge me rightly. He trusted God to judge correctly. <coughs> Nehemiah and how he handled the opposition trusted God. But even though he trusted God, he still rebukes the opposition. So in chapter 6, you, you have them sending these letters to him, trying to get him to stop the work. Uh, and uh, Nehemiah tells them in verse 8, No such things as you say have been done, for you are inventing them out of your own mind. They're accusing him. You're going to make yourself king in Judah. He says, no, I'm not going to. But he's also not going to stop the work to to go have a conversation with them. It's frustrating when we rebuke someone who doesn't listen, isn't it? When we correct someone, when we point to scripture even within the work of the church and we say, there, there's some, you're, you're not doing what is right, look at this. And it's like they don't hear us. It's frustrating. But I want you to notice that the opposition never once agreed with Nehemiah. Not once. They never said to him, oh, you're right. We should not be doing these things. They never once said that. And yet Nehemiah never refrained from rebuking them, but he also never stopped the work. Nehemiah, as I've been saying, I think is a great example for how we handle opposition, especially when it comes to the work of the church. And a lot of this has to do, I think, with the fact that he understood the value of the work. He operated, you know, on a value system where the work of God was at the very top. So that when people try to summon him, when they say, let's have a conversation, he doesn't go. He ignores that. He knows there's something more important going on. In fact, he, he was so concerned about the work that he arms the people so that the wall is completed, so that they can keep working were they ever attacked. He never stopped working, even in the face of opposition. And of course, in all of this, he demonstrates courage. Uh, now, I want you to, to go with me here. That his courage is really rooted in believing in something more important than himself. In fact, I think good courage will often, if not always, be rooted in this. Believing that there are things more important than ourselves. Nehemiah viewed the building of the wall as more important than himself. Something worth sacrificing his life over. In fact, you, you read that he doesn't uh, go to the temple. In chapter 6, verses 10 and 11, this is where the prophet <clears throat> tries to get him to meet in the house of God in the temple. And Nehemiah responds in verse 11, Should such a man as I run away? And what man such as I could go into the temple and live? I will not go in. Because even in, even in the face of distress, he still honored the holiness of the temple. He still recognized that there are things more important than him and his life. And cowardice is often rooted in the exact opposite of this, isn't it? It's rooted in selfishness, in viewing my life as more important than anyone else's life. 
to the point that I'm willing to give up other people in order not to have to endure any kind of punishment. If you want to be a person who has courage, you first start by being a person who believes in things more important than yourself. And the work of God is more important than ourselves. It's, it's such a, a concept that is contrary to anything that our society teaches us. Our society tries to teach us that we're more important than anyone else. They want us to value ourselves more important than anyone else because that's how they get us to spend money, right? To dress ourselves up and to honor ourselves. Anytime you have a society filled with people who value themselves above anyone else, you will have a society of cowards. If you do not want to be cowardly, but instead to be courageous, we first start with by believing, really believing, that there are things in this world that are more important than my wants. There are things more important than me getting my desires. And the work of God is one of those things. Opposition to the work will come. It has come in the past. For centuries, churches have been dealing with it. And it may come in the future for some of us as well. And my goal here is to help us to be able to recognize it when it comes. To see it for what it is. <coughs> to see that there are, there are observable patterns. One we observe in Nehemiah. Ones we observe in the New Testament. Ones we've observed maybe even our own past experiences. Where you have people who are not interested in being reasonable. They're not interested in truth. They're interested in manipulating and causing disruption and chaos. But we need to remember exactly what I think we've seen, that they don't have good reasons for it. There are ulterior motives. There's something else going on, no matter what they might say. As Jesus said, we'll know them by their fruits. We'll know them by their works. That their actions will speak much louder than their words, and their actions are what we should be, pay careful attention to. But also in Nehemiah, I think we have... Uh, a series of things we can do to help us overcome opposition or at least endure it when it does come. We can pray. We can trust answered prayers. We can trust God. We can trust his scriptures. We can trust him to judge rightly. What kind of a God would he be if he doesn't judge rightly? There are many different ways we can face this uh, and that we can come out on the other side unscathed for the most part. We can come out on the other side more unified, more loving, and more encouraged by one another. Because we are involved in the work of the church, every one of us. And this is a work that is much more important than any one individual. If you're here this morning, and you would like to be obedient to God, to come forward... <laughs> to be a, a member of his family, to be a part of the great work that he is doing in this world, uh, we would encourage you to come forward or to talk to us. Uh, if you need prayers, if you'd like to study, if you have any questions or concerns at all, please uh, make your need known now. Always stand and sing the invitation song.